Hello, our Good dear morning, friends. dear colleagues. And we'd like to welcome all our friends and colleagues from all the various regions who are joining in with our um, event today. And we have many colleagues with whom we met last year. And we've got a new tranche of projects in this region. We're carrying out work in Europe, Asia, and the East, Far East. And we're pleased to work with our colleagues from the org organization ISOKIS. And this is the second year when we've been organizing these meetings with Central Asia, and we welcome you on this basis. No, I think that the majority of us know that we, we are workers of RICC, which operates in Central Asia and the Caucasus, and from Amsterdam. And we have various offices and, and our colleagues there. I'm the moderator for this session, and I will help you to f see what's happening next. So we will have our introduction. I'll do this in a moment. We have a very interesting presentation from Yelena Kosit and Emil Abin from the RICC. They are doing a presentation on the internet resilience in Central Asia, which is interesting, the various links with our region, and the interesting connections with the events happening now, and in particular in our region with the recent changes. And there'll also be a small presentation by Alexander Isavin, who will speak about the mapping of Russian connectivity, which is a very interesting presentation. And I think you'll have questions following from that. Also, we'll have a discussion from these events that have been happening in our region, particularly in Central Asia, where we have networking. What can we do? How can we deepen these connections and improve the in essential infrastructure, which are connected with the global international forums? And we'll have a very good discussion. And then we will discuss what will happen next. And today we will be speaking about the very great work being done by our colleagues and we'll speak about that trend and the measures that the events are happening in Central Asia and we will announce the opportunities for doing this which could be very interesting for our partners in Central Asia particularly in terms of the operators of and many associations and industry why are we doing this? To help to, 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 to develop the internet in the Central Asian countries. What can we do? Sustainable. And, and we'll find the very clever ways for developing this system and means of finance for it. And all the things we can use to ensure that we have an effective internet system in Central Asia. It would, would be difficult to organize these sessions without support from our sponsors. So we give a particularly thanks, a thank you to Flex Optics, which is the sponsor of this series. And in particular, it helps us with translation. We, this is our meta, you all know meta. And this is attempting to make the, create the meta universe. Namex are our colleagues from the Roma Internet Exchange Point. Thank you to Namex. We're very grateful to them for the assistance they've given us. And we'll see the most important thing for our event is we're glad that you are all participating. The most important contribution that can be made to these events is by the organizers and the sponsors. I'm looking forward to hearing your, your enthusiastic questions and your active participation in the question and answer session. Many thanks.
very pleased to hand over to our colleague Emir Abyan from Rissa CC and Elena. Thank you. Thanks, Rahan. Yeah, Emil and I will do it together and I will be the first. Hello, everyone. My name is Yana and I'm working as a community builder for the RIPE NCC. I'm based in Belgrade, Serbia, and I work on supporting technical communities in the Southeastern Europe. And what Emil and I have prepared for you today is a brief introduction uh, to the internet measurement tools that RIPE NCC has been developing for the uh, last 10 plus years. First, I will tell you a bit about these tools, and then Emil will show you examples of a few different measurements that he created with the data gathered uh, by these platforms. Next slide. Yes, there we go. To measure is to improve. Oh, so let me explain uh, what we mean by that. So here you can see the picture that we chose to show you. It's, it is a city during the night and some parts of it are well lit and others are not. And you can imagine that there are incidents occurring all around the city, but can you guess which of those are going to get detected, reported, uh, and ultimately fixed? Well, probably the ones that are easier for us to see. And similar to that logic, when it comes to incidents and issues on the internet, the conclusion here is that you cannot fix what you cannot see. Network operators do have at their disposal a number of tools that they can use to observe the traffic in their own network. But that visibility is limited because you cannot see what's happening outside your network. For example, in your transit network. And using tools like RIPE Atlas or RIS allows you to see more. And observing the internet close to you will help you improve your network. So let's go into the tools. The first one is RIPE Atlas. So briefly, Atlas is a global platform for active internet measurements. It was developed with a goal of achieving uh, better insights and into internet connectivity and reachability around the world in real time. More specifically, we, we were curious to see how the packets flow and what latencies do we see. The platform is run by volunteers in our community and all the data gathered by measurements is publicly available. Practically, this is a large network of rather small devices called probes and anchors that you can see pictures on the slides. Probes are smaller on the left and they can do measurements towards other systems, while anchors are bigger machines that have the option of running measurements from, but also into them. Probes come ready to use, so plug and play, and they, there are over 11,000 of them uh, worldwide. But as, they can, as you can also see on the map, they are unevenly distributed around the globe, and most of them are being deployed in the Western parts of the world, Europe and the US. But technical people might be glad to hear that we also have software probes, which do require a bit of skill to install and run, but solve a lot of uh, logistical issues that might arise with hardware probes. But once the probe is connected um, to your network, it constantly performs a set of built-in measurements. So ping, trace route, DNS queries to the root name servers, and limited HTTP measurements. It doesn't look at the traffic or content. So NCC collects data produced by all these probes and provides internet maps, tools, and all sorts of visualizations based on the aggregated results. And if you host a probe or anchor, you can also run customized measurements to gain valuable information about the routability into your own network. Next tool is RIS, which stands for uh, Routing Information Service. And this is another community project that NCC has been supporting for a really long time. It is a routing data collection platform that consists of globally distributed set of remote route collectors who are typically uh, located at the internet exchange points. But we also have multi-hub collectors, and I will talk um, later about them in more detail. And these collectors collect and store internet routing data. So volunteers peer with 
with the collectors using the BJP protocol and restores the updates and withdraw messages. And there are a number of tools that use the RIS data. Some of them are our RIPE stat, and some are external tools like bgp.ag.net or BGP tools, Intent Health Report, or BGP Alerter. And this data can be very useful because it provides valuable, up-to-date information on things like what is being announced or which prefixes are seen and where, or which are not seen, and what routes are available, and so on. There's also a map, and it shows what it shows are, is that red circles are the locations of our route collectors, and the green dots are the peers that are feeding into our multi-hop collectors. Yes. <laughs> And one of the main problems of the internet routing system is that it doesn't provide a built-in uh, security mechanism. And a good way to increase that security is to pro provide better visibility into it that will lower the risk of routing incidents like BGP hijacks. I hope I wasn't speaking too fast for the translator. And now that I introduced the platforms, I will give the floor to Emil. Who, will, who has a couple of uh, examples of how we use these tools for analysis. And later I will come back to tell you how with your help we can make them even better. So, Emil? Okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Elena. Yeah, I will show a couple of examples of measurements, analysis that we did and how they relate to the resilience of the internet. First one, and I you need to move people out of the way in my screen so I can actually see what's on screen. So first one, this was January this year, Kazakhstan. There were outages reported there. And because we have these Ripe Atlas probes, these little devices in uh, Kazakhstan deployed there by volunteers in, in Kazakhstan, we actually have some insight into what is what was actually going on. So what you see here is a graph that on the y-axis shows the number of connected probes and on, on the x-axis has time. So you can actually see patterns of probes connecting and disconnecting at the same time in, in, in various patterns. And what you can also see here is we divided this up into infrastructure probes. So that's these Ripe Atlas anchors. They're typically deployed near infrastructure and other probes that we could identify as being routing infrastructure or close to them. And they are in red. That's the red line and the gray is the, the, all the other probes. So that's probes installed in offices, in homes. So you can see different types of connectivity going on in Kazakhstan as the events unfolded. And you actually see various diurnal patterns. So daily up and downs there, we wrote a Ripe Labs article. Ripe Labs is our platform for uh, showing these analyses. And it's also available for our community. So for you, if you have interesting things to write about your internet, we have a platform for that. And we also made this visualization available as an open source tool. If you go to that link there, you can, for any country that has Ripe Atlas probes, you can actually see how the probes go up and down. You can also do that per autonomous system. So per network or per region. So it, it's a versatile tool to actually see what's going on in a particular geographic area with regards to internet connectivity. And this is a very basic signal that shows this. And now on to my second example. And I think Alexander will talk in more depth about this particular thing, which is the connectivity of Russia. The connectivity to the wider internet of Russian networks, Russian end users. And here we use a uh, ripe risk data, routing data, the BGP data to paint a picture of how Russia is connected to the wider internet. Uh, and the background of that is because of the war in Ukraine and sanctions that various companies said they would uh, impose onto Russian companies, we wanted to analyze what actually was happening on the internet. And we detailed that in another Ripe Labs article. So it's on labs.net at the URL that's on this, on this slide. 
And I just wanted to briefly explain this picture. What you see here is routing data. So this is each line is a connection that we see in VCP. And the dots are Russian networks and networks connected to Russian networks. The Russian networks are colored red, and we've colored the, the tier one networks, we colored them green. So these are what you could consider the core of the internet. And the size of the nodes, the size of the dots is relative to how many end users, how many people are actually connected via that network. And that could mean both connected directly via that network, but also indirectly. For instance, as an example, level three, which is a, is the green dot here that has is bigger than, than the small dots because it provides connectivity, for instance, Ross Telecom and other big Russian networks. So it also has influence uh, over how Russia connects to the wider internet. I didn't explain the blue dots. The blue dots are all the other networks that the Russian networks are connected to. And you can actually see there is a lot of connectivity as that we can see in our, our routing data that, that, that we collect. And I hope Alexander can later on show some more. I think I, I saw some really nice fiber data from him in a previous call. So I hope that would augment this. A third, oh wait, no, I'm not at this third example yet. Of course, this is the Central Asia appearing form. So we also made graphs for the Central Asia countries with using the same methodology because the graphing, the colors are a little bit different. But I just want briefly want to show you all five countries that we analyzed. This is Kyrgyzstan. There's probably familiar names here in, in purple for the Kyrgyzstan people and the Kyrgyzstan networks. You see a lot of Russian networks they depend on to get to the wider internet. And also Hurricane, who's an American company. Here is Kazakhstan. It's basically a similar picture. Kaz Telecom is very central there, which means that it has many Kazakhstan users as well as also an upstream for many Kazakhstan networks that have users. This is Tajikistan, Tajik Telecom is very large. And again, Russian networks here. And one thing I found interesting here is actually, I've heard about the, the digital Silk Road and connectivity into China, but to the extent that we collect data, we have not seen very many uh, signals of this happening, at least not in, in this type of uh, visualization that we do. Here's the connectivity for Turkmenistan. So Turkmen Telecom is very large there. And again, the colors are, are a bit changed. So now the tier one's core of the internet is orange here. But what's interesting here is that apart from connectivity via Ross Telecom, there's also a, a very large dependency on Delta Telecom, which is an Azeri network. And if you look at cable maps, you can actually also see that there's a cable across the Caspian Sea from Turkmenistan and towards Azerbaijan. And the last one here is Uzbekistan, and that has a, a very similar picture as the first three. So that was my second example. And having, uh, of course, having multiple, having a, a, a variety of options for your internet national connectivity increases your uh, reliance because if one of these parties goes away or has a problem, the others can fill in for that. Let's put it that way. And the last example that I want to show is actually, this is not the central Asia region. It's a bit further West. It's the situation in Ukraine. And with the invasion going on there, I was actually surprised by how resilient the local internet there was. And we started looking into why is that? And I have a colleague, Alex Semenyaka who already in 2019 gave a, a very good presentation on why the internet is there the way it is. And so we authored another labs article about the resilience there and what we can learn from it. The factors that we identified is there's a low market concentration. So there's not a big monopoly player in the end user market. There's, there are many internet exchange points, which helps in having diversity in connectivity. There are many physical fiber paths, which helps. And this is a very important and maybe under uh, stress factor is the humans. There's human connections. There's a lot of dedication, courage, and perseverance 
uh, in trying to keep the network going there. And that's exemplified by, by this picture where in the midst, amidst all of the bubble and destruction, an engineer is splicing at fiber or is working on getting fiber working again. So to stress this, this one of the points uh, a little bit uh, more is there's a visualization here of how the end user networks in Ukraine are interconnected. And this is using our RIP Atlas platform, What you can see on the outside the arc of this visualization is the, the, the number of users in each, uh, or the percentage of user in each network. And we only visualized all of the networks that have over 1% of users. And as you can see, 55% of this arc is missing, which basically means that for 55% of the market is served by ISPs that have less than 1% of the market. So that's very diffuse. There's no, no big monopoly player. And actually in economics, there's an indicator called the HI and the I stands for index. And that number goes from zero to one. One is a monopoly and Ukraine has one of the lowest numbers there in the world, which means it's very low concentration. And you also see connectivity, like a lines in this visualization going to, to central nodes there, these are the exchange points. And here you can also already see how exchange points play a, a vital role in the, in the internet in Ukraine. And we actually made this by using these RIP Atlas probes and to do a mesh measurement between the, the end user networks, and then just seeing if the IXPs are in these path or not. And another example of that type of measurement is a, a visualization we have about the internet exchange points, the IXPs. If we look at PeeringDB, which is a, a database where you can register IXPs and networks, and I would encourage everybody to register their network because it, your network becomes discoverable that way. PeeringDB has 19 IXPs in Ukraine, and 13 of them are visible between the, the, the 200 probes that we have in, in Ukraine. And that's uh, a lot. And so what we actually do is do again, do mesh measurements. So they, they, these are technically, these are uh, called trace routes. And we just look at the, if we see peering lands for, for any of these IXPs. And there's not only a lot of uh, the connectivity between uh, these probes sees at least one IXP. What you can also see in the picture is there's a lot of different colors, which means that there's a lot of different IXPs in the particular territory. So there's not a single dominant IXP and you, there's also very, there's a lot of different options for connectivity and that helps in resilience. So that was the part uh, that I had prepared and I hope this contributes to, to discussions about resilience of the internet in Central Asia. But now I want to uh, give it back to Yelena for uh, a couple of asks and, uh, and the takeaways. Yeah, thanks. How can you can help us improve these tools? First, you can help us improve risks by shining the light on the structure of the internet in your country. And on the slide, you can see a chart uh, that shows the, an average AS path path length between risk and prefixes in your region. So for Y axis, you can see that it shows the average distance per country. So the number of AS hops that we need to go through to reach you, to reach those prefixes. And those countries that are circled are the five Central Asian countries. And you can see that Tajikistan is four AS hops away from us. And other countries are, most of them are grouped between 2.5 and 3 hops. Uh, so this number could be much, <laughs> could be lower. And uh, because BGP is information hiding protocol, and on every AS hop, it will only forward uh, the best path, this will hide the number of routes that we can see, and it will obscure the full topology of the network of the country. And what we want to do is to bring those prefixes closer to us so that we can have better network observability, which uh, would make the analysis uh, that we can do about the country uh, more accurate. And for example, for Tajikistan, we would need a network from the country to establish a BGP peering session with one of our multi-hop collectors. 
And if some of you are network operators in Central Asia, who are able to do this, or maybe somebody else who is, and are able to convince them um, that bearing grid trees is good for the country, please reach out to, uh, to us. We will leave our contact details at the end of the presentation. When it comes to, so next slide, when it comes to Atlas, as I mentioned before, there is this huge discrepancy of number of uh, probes in uh, Europe and outside of Europe. And when it comes to geographical co uh, coverage, we can see on the map that some countries in Central Asia are have a pretty decent coverage, for example, Kazakhstan. And this allowed us to do uh, very interesting measurements like the ones that Emil mentioned earlier. Other countries like Turkmenistan at the moment do not have an active probe. And of course, this is something that we would like to see changing. Another way of looking at it is percentage of the population that is in a network which has at least one Atlas probe. And here we see a slightly different results than on this previous slide, where, for example, Tajikistan has nine active probes in the country, out of which uh, two probes are in networks that, that serve about 56% uh, of the population. And in the appendix, we included the uh, breakdown of every Central Asia country, where you can see which exact network does host the probe and which ones uh, don't do it yet. And we would love to see more probes being deployed to Central Asian countries. And we know that there is an interest from the community to host them. So we are in contact with few people who have a role of Atlas ambassadors, which means that they receive a number of uh, probes, hardware probes that they can distribute to the community. They shared with us there are certain difficulties when it comes to importing the equipment. So please let us know if there are other ways for us to get those probes in. And also keep in mind that software pro probes are also a viable option for you. So next slide. So both RIS and Atlas are open platforms run by, with the help of the community and for the purpose of supporting the community. And uh, you can help us to increase the quality of the data that we collect, increasing the observability and making the internet better. First for your network, uh, second for your country, and last for the whole internet. And if you have any questions, we are here and we are, we will be glad to answer them. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. We already have some feedback in chat. So Talent has mentioned that they can host the crop. So the Kyrgyzstan turns from yellow to green. And that's a great, great activity. We'll, uh, of course, contact yeah. you and yeah, <laughs> and here's also, and I'll give you that uh, opportunity. Thank you, Alexander. Has switched in. We're very grateful to him. Let's have an exchange of opinions. Our discussion time will come later. There are two questions which have been raised. The first one, Talat has, has asked. Thanks so much, Lahan. Just a quick comment, a suggestion for Emilia and Milena. Uh, maybe uh, we could find a collaboration with the ITU UNICEF initiative called GIGA where they're connecting all the schools in the world to the internet. Perhaps somehow we could uh, incorporate the uh, Atlas probe effort with the Giga uh, and there will be more probes in the region at least. So that was just an idea I'd like to share. Yeah. Thank you, Talant. We've discussed this question. It's a very in interesting initiative. Perhaps we could try once again to see what we can do to help with some resources, but we should be able to do something within the framework of this project. And once again, we'll discuss with Elena and our comrades, our friends. Let's now move over to our presentation, if you don't object, by Alexander Isyanin with his short presentation on Russian connectivity, data connectivity in Russia, and neighboring countries. This will be a very brief introduction to the subject. 
And therefore, I'll simply show you some um, pictures, uh, give you a general picture. I'd like to shed some light on the, the title of the presentation. I would like to speak about the proximity of the borders of Russia to Central Asia. And we, of course, are unambiguously interested in discussing this subject. And I'll let you see what's on the screen. We have a great deal of open data in Russia, in, including information on licenses for building. Yeah, so here's what's happening and in the Russian Federation. With open data, we've produced this map and you can see the places where there's a chance to cross the border into Central Asia. There are only a few places and these clearly, mainly on the, in Kazakhstan, there is one from Omsk to, and Orienburg. We have only a few crossing points for cables um, across borders. And there are a number of places where this happens. There, f f f there are several cables which cross the border. Basically, they run parallel with the electricity lines or railway lines. And mainly these cables belong to companies which have the necessary infrastructure. The distance from Western Europe is huge. And therefore, to build this infrastructure, you need very substantial investments. And in fact, in addition to speaking about the changing situation there, we can see where on the border with the Ukraine, the basic crossing points occur. They were in the region of Belgrade and Kharkov. The, this happened for historical reasons, and Russia began to develop towards Finland and Sweden for the mass market. But there was also points in Kharkov and Belgrade. So cables are built where they have permission which can be rather complicated to achieve. And so in the Belgrade of Kharkov uh, area, this was one of the first uh, lines which was available for commercial customers. So here there's traffic which went from Russia and then and on to Central Asia and then to the north of Petersburg and Kharkov. So we see in, in Russia a number of delays, hold-ups. Hold so the main thing is the licenses for construction, where you have to do construction work or install cables. And now for the internet, you have heard that you need community accountability for cables. And this accountability has to be shown with the, the users so such as the owners of the fiber optic cables and the capacity of these cables. The data isn't always opened. In addition, the infrastructure which we look at, we see in Central Asia, here we have the marketing framework taken from an item in print. There are roughly 20 companies which have inter-regional links and links with Central Asia. You can see that although there are many cables in Russia, the main lines belong to Rostelecom, and which is building its, in many cases, several lines go from one cable. Again, the distances are enormous and there are serious pressures on this, particularly in the eastern section of the f f access from the Russian Federation to lines, con con connection lines. So here we see on this map the connections with Kazakhstan. This is mainly marketing material, but you can see in this also, some companies provide information on 
what about their own network? So this is a map of uh, RETN company, which originally was Russian company. Uh, and it is independent, so it does not belong to uh, major operators or Ostelecom. And they're showing their map going through Central Asia. They're actively building their own fibers. They're leasing uh, wavelengths. Uh, and we see how the cables going through Central Asia, then to China and to Eastern Asia. Unlike China, as we see now, they have point of presence in Central Asia when you can buy layer 3 connectivity. But you see they are not going to Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and Turkmenistan. I think that this cable is a part of, of international projects, which are actually a united project you, uh, joy, joined by tier 1 operators or European operators. But we usually see marketing materials, but no much about building their connectivity, physical connectivity or availability of leasing wavelength or layer two connectivity. So you see compared maybe to even European RTN network, the Central Asian and Russian networks going to the Eastern parts of Russia are not very developed like any other networks of this kind. And maybe my last uh, slide, I also mapped connectivity of Inog region for Inog meetings, I think last year or previously, it's old enough picture. So in these pictures, we see uh, Inog countries except Ukraine and Russia, because, well, it's very difficult to map a lot of factors, 2000 ISS or, or two, more than 2000, closer to 3000 autonomous system numbers. In Ukraine, more than 5,000 in Russia, so uh, picture will be unreadable. So I mapped only other countries and uh, their border areas with which they are connected to. And we see that there is no, not much connectivity going not through Russia, so Russia is pink here. We see Belarus with exact one connecti major connectivity. We see Moldova, we see so Caucasus with, jo with Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan connected together through Russia and others. And we see Central Asia, where Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan very well interconnected, while Uzbekistan and Tajikistan are connected not very well. So I hope uh, that that could be studied if this is virtual peering series in Central Asia, we can prepare more detailed, not just a layer three study. So th this picture is built from road collector data, which I mean previously shown, but we also could study economical impacts and others. Thank you very much. I think we will be able to talk about Russian connectivity separately and maybe it worth it, the definitive event which we'll organize, tell and discuss what's happening during war times. So, well, but in this case, we have to be very accurate uh, in what we saw. Well, we see that the internet is resilient and the people restoring inactively and the government start, tries to interact with internet regulation, especially in war times. So I think it needs to be studied uh, separately. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I'd like to add that Alexander recently was on our platform, Claps. You can give um, ask questions, qu short questions to Alexander. And we can also deal with it in the discussion. But I think if there are, may, th there are, hello, good day. Hello, Alexander. I have a short question. Where do the routing channels go from Azerbaijan? Is it without channels at all? No, there is a reasonable number of channels. All the f telephone operators are there. I, I just didn't see, if you don't mind. We'll, we'll return to the discussion of geography during, during the, this session. I also added a reference to an Emil's article, which shows Russia and the internet. And it, there are very, a, a large number of articles. So thank you. But before, we move on to our discussion. Our, the participants in our discussion are our colleagues from Central Asia, to Golubayev, we, and our various other colleagues, Hata, Ziza. So everyone will be there. Everyone will have their questions. So bef before we go on to that part of the discussion, I'd like to inform you that we can share the references for this session for 
with our colleagues. Today, we can announce the beginning of receiving applications for taking up this enterprise, Central Asia Forum. It will be it take place in the fourth quarter, and in Kazakhstan, we are preparing for this, and we're planning to have events in Uzbekistan as well. It will be a Central Asia Peering Forum, and it will be a major event in Central Asia. And we are going to connect with main nodes. And if you would like to host it or participate in it, please do address us. The email address is available. And also, I will put into chat the description of the event and email address. And now I would like uh, to uh, our unmute their microphones and uh, to discuss what are the possibilities, what are the opportunities, and what influence on Central Asian Internet had the latest events and uh, what are the future consequences. If we do not use it, we can at, at least to minimize the damage. So, Talgat, let's uh, talk about the main speakers and uh, then our colleagues, our participants will take places, take part as well. Good day, dear colleagues. I would like to welcome everyone. Dear welcoming students on our behalf. Yes, of course, yes. I recently gave an interview to Radio Liberty. Well, our colleagues know we have a regional uh, station, Radio Liberty. And I was gave an interview there about the latest actions of the, Russia's aggression and this causes problems for the internet, of course. We ask people to avoid making political judgments as part of our housekeeping rules, if we may. That's fine, I won't mention any more politics. But we have a tier one provider, Lewin, and the second one I can't remember. And they have equipment for a Russian provider, and the situation, of course, has deteriorated. The position of the Russian internet has, has definitely become worse. And as Alexander said, we can see that there are not many channels to Central Asia. As the situation is becoming worse and worse, the other providers will take over from Russia for the internet. And I've spoken about this for a long time to my colleagues. And they, they said this is nonsense, but there's for 14 years there's been a law in Russia about the internet and there are articles which say that under certain conditions Russian providers can therefore in Central Asia and Kazakhstan Alexander demonstrated this very clearly in Central Asia apart from Turkmenistan which is a special case um, because it has access to the Caspian Sea but this doesn't affect our a situation very seriously. Therefore, the question that stands before us in Kazakhstan in the first instance is which internet paths can we have? Is it to Azerbaijan or to Turkey? And I think this question has to be looked at in all aspects, at all levels. And I'll give a reference to Radio Liberty. And I think that our Central Asian colleagues also and public organizations we have to f make ways of installing these routes. So first of all, yes, uh, the, we should unite the efforts of all Central Asian countries and to address international organizations to for the European uh, community to help us to make this obvious to Kazakhstan government because it's uh, the problem of national security. We need uh, to have our own 
routes of internet that would be not through Russia. Without political context, this alternative route could be GP or we uh, improve connectivity and effectivity of internet and even if the uh, conflict is over then to have this channel is of utmost importance for the country this is my point of view and uh, this uh, question should be raised at all levels and the pressure should be exercised both in the country and uh, outside the country from the from abroad they could uh, send a letter to the ministry relevant ministry and uh, help us with the issue and uh, this is the issue that we uh, cannot put aside and uh, we have to exercise pressure on the government also I would like uh, to uh, say thank you, Emil, to Alexandra and Elena for their very interesting presentations. We have, I have different ideas about uh, measurements, but I'm going to write about them to out with our conference. This is a technical issue. Thank you for your attention. And uh, now... I would like to mention my article. The interview I gave is about internet connectivity. Thank you. Thank you. If we leave political um, events uh, aside, the uh, idea is that we have to diversify the channels. And so let's look at what other other speakers and participants have to say. Good day, dear colleagues. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this event. And thank you also to Elena and Alexander for their presentations. There are many interesting things which I found out. But every time I find out something new in these presentations, and it's very important for us in Kazakhstan, so thank you very much for giving me the, the chance to speak. I would like to say that I'm not quite in agreement with what Talgan said, but connecting Kazakhstan with other countries, since we already have connections with the Russian Federation and with China, I don't have anything against alternative routes. The, it's important to have connections for a reliable system. When operators from two countries uh, connect with each other, this does not mean that the Russian Federation would decide to um, cut itself off f for the Kazakhstan internet. There's a possibility for transit traffic to come. So I think that there is a risk, but it's not maybe as high as Talgat seemed to suggest. As far as the network operations are concerned, in these extraordinary conditions, I would like to say that in Kazakhstan, the connections stopped operating abruptly in January of this year, and the internet stopped working not just externally, but within the country as well. And connectivity was lost with a significant part of the network, with the TTP DNS, and it wasn't able, we weren't able to connect it up again immediately. So our association and the other associations have proposed to the appropriate government bodies that they should not divide the connectivity of our, our civil system. We encounter problems with information cooperation and interaction, but this affects the operations of enterprises which make great use of the internet as an important part of their functions. There are instances where we don't have the complete switch off of the internet. But in 
principle, we'll see what consequences there are in future and that we can comment on this. It would be strange because Russia's attitude to Central Asia is not very polite. They take away the cable and they do not think about the consequences. So we had to use Azerbaijan and Turkish channels to reroute the traffic. As the practice shows, the relationship uh, between Kazakhstan and Central Asia with Russia, our northern neighbor, is uh, not very good dealing with our problems. These comments from Vladimir about the virtual telecanals, it is uh, ridiculous. And uh, let us technic find out the technical aspects and avoid the political political attitude. Let's try to minimize them. If uh, there was a comment, I'm glad uh, that I uh, made Talgat happy, but uh, never mind. I uh, would like a uh, note about virtual channels. Maybe Talgat uh, should uh, get a deeper understanding of how the connection works, and uh, it's uh, not uh, necessary, not necessary to do it uh, the way Talgat thinks. It could be done in other way. As regards uh, the others, I will, yes, remain silent. I have a comment, just a short comment. I worked on Kazakhcom and uh, it was a main route and as regards the traffic through China at the moment 99-95% of traffic goes through Russia and it is good if 5% goes through China. Uh, Gospodin, uh, Mr. Turikhanov, let's not argue. I I am a lecturer, I am active as CCNP, and uh, I worked with major providers in Kazakhstan, so let's not argue. Thank you, thank you very much for your comments, thank you Vladimir for your moderation. On, we have Alexander Savin, but also Aziz. I am quite happy, let me be a fourth. I will have my comment later. Talan, thank you. Maybe I will add one more direction, which is very important. It is we have to look at the example of Afghanistan and where the government politics was established uh, that there should be several connectivity points and through Iran and Pakistan, and as uh, regards the influence of digital information, we have a project. We want to connect rural areas, distant rural areas, to Internet, and engineers say that it is very expensive in terms of plant in current situation. The next direction, unpredictable, is digital economy. It is platforms which are uh, popular, uh, different platforms. We are not clear how they are going to work, but the local platforms are being developed, like for example, Kermarkid And the, through Kermarkid G, we use, for example, not only pizza, but also live cows. Uh, someone from Italy ordered a cow together with delivery from Kurdistan. An interesting situation. We are also uh, depend on Russian language, and uh, content is uh, a big question. We have to develop the content. It's called Sanare San, the digital citizen where we plan to do it in English and in Russian. 
Uh, digital skills is a very important direction, is one more, and the uh, creative industry within our countries, uh, they are preparing materials in different language, uh, languages. For example, the Billions Company and uh, my children are singing uh, their song. And this song got enormous amount of sings. And finally, I would to say that cyber security is very important, and we are working on a regional initiative, Technical Society. This is the protection of a civil society, private users, and the civil sector needs help. We would like to provide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Talent. Before we pass over to Alexander about the opportunities for developing activities, Talant already spoke about the, the, the digital market. Even Turkmenistan, which has very few Atlas probes, uh, connections with Iran, with Azerbaijan, with Kazakhstan, with Uzbekistan. So there are opportunities here for working with Kazakhstan. We'll see how it turns out, but for Uzbekistan through Turkmenistan and Iran and even through Europe, there are lots of possibilities. There is also an initiative which is uh, entitled INISCAP, within which there are regional projects for not only for fiber optic, but for s server resources, which depend on the general fiber optic system. So we can work actively in, in that area. Alex has just shown a link to a document with participation of hosts in Central Asia. So if you go there, you find it's very interesting that there are all the contacts shown. So if you're interested in this, Alexander has shown yet another picture. I wanted uh, to talk about it myself because now really is the Central Asian countries are not only landlocked countries, they are also sanction-locked countries. And this uh, story uh, that uh, they have Iran uh, with good connectivity with Persian Gulf, but connectivity with Russia and the third side is China. So they have the pressure from all ends. So maybe international politics uh, should provide some help. Let's not uh, talk about politics. And uh, next, uh, Max, Max will tell us that my time is over. Uh, so politics, really, to call what is happening war is risky only for myself. And i happy to see Alex Semenyaka and Gooden just now. God is saying that Russia can just switch off Central Asia it's really, really a truth, not only for you, but also to citizens of Russia, to people of Russia. We, I would like to tell countries that we have a pressure in Central Asia, in Belarus, political atmosphere. That's why the businesses are not developing. Infrastructure, internet infrastructure is not developing very well. They didn't have pressure in Ukraine and they had a excellent development of infrastructure, which is resilient during the war. Lots of things in there and it 
it is easy to repair. The routes, main routes from Russia are from Ukraine, uh, through Ukraine and through North Scandinavian countries, not through Belarus, because Belarus, Beltelecom, their conditions are not very good. But here we have an independent operator in Ukraine, and so uh, we. That's why we are talking about this Silk Route. If there is no possibilities for development, for development, business, to economy, the economic freedom, Central Asia is very seriously remote. They have borders with China, with Afghanistan. Afghanistan has a mountains regions on the border, and if independent countries will start building a cable, what did the independent countries before? It will be very expensive project, impossible without international help. ISOC helps to build. Uh, community networks. Uh, these are wonderful efforts, but they are comparatively small. We have Meta. Uh, Meta is building cables through Asia, use balloons and so on. Don't know if we have any representatives from Meta, but I think that there should be a big uh, conglomeration of companies that would help to develop infrastructure in essential countries go through Iran, which will have less sanctions, through Turkey and Azerbaijan, Georgia. From here you have to uh, overcome geographical issues, because otherwise the unification might not happen. If you look at the map, that Retna uh, goes through China on the second tier, and they do not have a protocol. Traffic in Ch to China is much more expensive uh, than in Europe. What affects Russia in terms of war with Ukraine is many Russian European operators of the second tier uh, and then connected in Ukraine, they connected to global operators. In other words, from Tier 1 uh, to and Level 3 reached it as well. Just a very few nodes of uh, third tier were connected in uh, Ukraine, and this uh, seriously affected the connectivity. Together with Internet Society, we uh, tried to look at technology. So this is the graph between uh, Russian and European AS. In spite uh, of the hostilities with damages to cable, in spite of the fact uh, that Ukrainian uh, regulator decided to switch off, these European European exchange links were not interrupted at any times. It was uh, slow. It was lowered, but infrastructure restores itself, and there is hope uh, for our Central Asian colleagues if they take infrastructure of second level through Russia, and it will not be easier because uh, Rostelecom, Transtelecom would not like it uh, because they would suppress competitors. I do not understand it, but it's the case. So we have to direct our efforts uh, to exactly this area and existing situation will allow Central Asian uh, operators improve their connectivity by all possible ways, not only the five boring countries, but many more. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you precisely because you've dealt with the question and we've looked at various peering forums in the fourth quarter. But I'd just like to say, to finish off, I have information to show the tradition and 
virtual peering phones is for to conduct each meeting for the Central Asian Forum. We have that's four times in this e this year. We've as part of this series, and I'd like to point out that sponsors have helped us organise these meetings, give Max a, an opportunity to, to to welcome them, and uh, give his opinion on this matter. Thank you, Bahan. And thank you, everyone, for participating today. As Vahan said, we've been organizing together with Ripen CC and, and together with EuroIX these events in order to bring more content, to bring more knowledge about the peering ecosystem in Central Asia. Now, one thing that we have, in a way, not done yet is to ask participants for presentations, to make an open call for presentations. And I think this is going to be important as we evolve from an event that we started with the hope of bringing more knowledge about connectivity, about interconnection, to a, a, a more interesting community that interacts and discusses these issues. This event, number five, was organized as a discussion on connectivity matters in the region because we received as Internet Society a request from Talgat, for example, but we would like to ask you if you have in the next days, in the next week, if you have any suggestions for topics, but also, and more especially, if you have a suggestion on like presentations that you would like to give, if you have anything in mind. We are, we're always interested in having someone from the region present. We can bring content, as you could see with Ripen CC, with Emil and uh, Yelena, who I really thank you for their presentation. I thank again Alexander for also his very good insights into how connectivity is around Russia and in the surrounding regions. But we are always interested in more content. And we're going to have another event at the end of May. So if you have any suggestion on a presentation or on a topic, let us know. And I'm going to write my, my email address in the chat in a moment. Vahan is going to write his email address as well. And we're looking forward to, to get your suggestions or your presentations soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Max. You can be sure that if anyone answers your letter, we work together so you can send it to whoever you like, Max, me, other con other colleagues in the organization. So it doesn't matter who you send your communications to, we will draw you into our next event. Just before we finish, I would like to say to Alex Simiaki, we've had a very good discussion and uh, I'd like to point out that we meet online. It's not a personal meeting, and it's somewhere between traditional encounters and discussions by email. But we have our traditions. and We have traditional mailing lists in the RIPCC and others. And first of all, the mail list of RIPE where we discuss all topics which are actual for a specific region. And we, you do not need any special membership or anything. You uh, can take part in discussion. And uh, we haven't finalized the topics that we uh, mentioned today. They should be developed. Uh, they could be forgotten or omitted. And uh, yes, we could have said something which should be continued in our communication. It's a mechanism that worked for years. And I do hope that the next event will be, will have lively discussion and uh, we will not repeat what we've already discussed, but we will move uh, forward uh, to the topics and we'll see the results. That would be great if we could see the results. And if someone gets any 
moments, any kind of a glimpse of movement, please uh, do not tell us. And uh, even five minutes uh, would be important if you could share your experience. Please do declare it. Please write us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to express my gratitude to the speakers and the participants in our discussion. And I'd like to also pass on our gratitude to our colleagues who you didn't hear, but who were present and took an active part in the um, sessions. But Max, of course, we'd like to thank our interpreters and from EuroX and for all the technical help that we've received. So thank you to everyone, and we will m meet for our next event. When will that be, Max? 26th May. Before May the 1st, we'll receive applications for the Forum on Central Asia, which we don't know where yet. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you for those for the lively discussion and until we meet 